there were some parts of Philostrato's tale that caused the ladies to blush, others that provoked their laughter, and as soon as it had come to an end, the queen requested Pampanea to take up the storytelling. She accordingly began as follows, laughing all over her face. Some people, have dis having discovered or heard a thing of which they were better left in ignorance, are so foolishly anxious to publish the fact that sometimes, in censoring the inadvertent failings of others with the object of lessening their own dishonor, they increase it out of all proportion. And I now propose, fair ladies, to illustrate the truth of this assertion by describing a contrary state of affairs, wherein... The wisdom of a mighty monarch was matched by the guile of a man whose social standing was possibly inferior to that of Mazzetto. When Agilulf became king of the Lombards, he followed the example set by his predecessors of choosing the city of Pavia in Lombardy as the seat of his kingdom. He had meanwhile married Theodolinda, who was the beautiful widow of the former Lombard king, Althrari. And although she was very intelligent and virtuous woman, she once had a, the, a most unfortunate experience with a suitor of hers. Now, actually, everything up until this point is actually true. These are real people, and so on. Now we get into fiction. For during a period of affairs of Lombardy, owing to the wise and resolute rule of King Agilulf, uh, were relatively calm and prosperous. One of the queen's grooms, a man of exceedingly low birth, gifted out of all proportion to his hum very humble calling, he was a tall and handsome, as tall and handsome as the king himself, happened to fall hopelessly in love with his royal mistress. Since his low station in life had not blinded him to the fact that the passion of his was thoroughly improper, he had the good sense not to breathe a word about it to anyone, nor did he even dare to tell, um, or to even to cast telltale glances in the lady's direction. But although he was quite resigned to the fact that he would never win her favor, he could at least claim that his thoughts were directed towards a lofty goal. And being scorched, all over by the flames of love, he outshone every one of his companions by, zealous, by the zealous manner in which he performed any trifling service that might conceivably bring pleasure to the queen. Thus it came about that whenever the queen was obliged to go out on horseback, she preferred to ride the palfrey that was under his care rather than any of the others. On these occasions, the fellow considered himself to be in his seventh heaven, and he would remain close beside her stirrup almost swooning with joy whenever he was able simply to brush against the lady's clothes. However, one frequently finds in affairs of this sort that the weakening of expectations goes hand in hand with the strengthening of the initial passion. And that is exactly what happened in this case, uh, in the case of this poor groom. So much so, in fact, that having no glimmer of hope to sustain him, he found it increasingly difficult to keep his secret yearnings under control. And since he was unable to rid himself of his passion, he kept telling himself that he would have to die. In reflecting on the ways and the means, he was determined to die in such a manner that his motive, in other words, his love for the queen, would be inferred from the circumstances leading up to his death. And at the same time, he resolved that these circumstances should offer him an opportunity of trying his luck and seeing whether he could bring his desire entirely, either wholly or partially to fruition. Knowing that it would be quite futile to start either confiding in the queen or writing letters to acquaint her with his love, he thought he would explore the possibility of entering her bed by means of stratagem. He had already discovered that the king was not in the habit of invariably sleeping with her, and hence... One, the one and only strategy that might conceivably succeed was for him to find some way of impersonating the king so that he could approach her quarters and gain admittance to her bedchambers. Accordingly, with the aim of discovering how the king was dressed and what procedure to fo he followed when paying the queen a visit, the groom concealed himself for several nights running in the king's palace in a spacious hall situated near the respective royal bedchambers. And during one of these nocturnal vigils, he saw the king emerge from his room with an, in an enormous cloak, with a flaming torch in one hand and a stick in the other. 
Walking over to the queen's room, the king knocked once or twice on the door with his stick, whereupon he was instantly admitted and the torch was removed from his hand. Some time later, the king retired in like fashion to his own quarters, and the groom, who had been keeping a careful watch, decided that he too would have to adopt the same ritual. He therefore procured a torch and a stick and a cloak similar to the one that he had seen the king wearing, and having soaked himself thoroughly in a hot bath so that there should be no possibility of his giving offense to the queen or arousing her suspicion by smelling of the stable, he transported these articles to the great hall and concealed himself in his usual place. When he sensed that everyone was asleep, and that the time had finally come for him to gratify his longings or perish nobly in the attempt, he kindled a small flame with the aid of a flint and steel that he had brought along for the purpose, lit his torch, and wrapping himself carefully up in the folds of the cloak, walked over to the door of the bedchamber and knocked twice with a stick. The door was opened by a chambermaid, still half asleep, who took the light and put it aside, whereupon, without uttering a sound, he stepped inside the curtain, divested himself of his cloak, and clambered into bed where the queen was sleeping. Knowing that the king, whenever he was angry about anything, was in the habit of refusing all discourse, he drew the queen lustfully into his arms with a short and gruff impatience, and without a single word passing between them, he repeatedly made her carnal acquaintance. He was most reluctant to depart, but nevertheless he eventually rose, fearing lest, by overstaying his welcome, the delight he had experienced should be turned into sorrow, and having donned his cloak and retrieved his uh, torch, he stole wordlessly away and returned as swiftly as possible to his own bed. He could hardly have reached his destination when, to the queen's utter amazement, the king himself turned up in her room, climbed into bed, and offered her a cheerful greeting. Heavens, she said, and emboldened to speak by his affable manner. Whatever has come over you tonight, my lord? You no sooner leave me after enjoying me more passionately than usual than you come back and start all over again. Do take care of your health. On hearing these words, the king immediately came to the conclusion that the queen had been taken in by an, out, by an outward resemblance to his own physique and manner. But he was a wise man, and since neither the queen nor anybody else appeared to have noticed the deception, he had no hesitation in deciding to keep his own counsel. Many a stupid man would have reacted differently and exclaimed, It was not I who was the man who was, or who was the man who was here, or what happened, or who was it who came? But this would only have led to complications, upsetting the lady when she was blameless and sowing the seeds of, of a desire on her part to repeat the experience. And besides, by holding his tongue, his honor remained unimpaired, whereas if he were to talk, he would make himself look ridiculous. And so, showing little sign of his turbulent inner feelings, either in his speech or in his facial expression, the king answered her as follows. Do you think, my dear, that I am incapable of returning to you a second time after being here once already? Oh, no, my lord, she replied, but all the same, I beg you not to overdo it. Your advice is sound. I intend to follow it, said the king. I shall go away again and bother you no further tonight. And so, boiling with anger and indignation because of the trick that had clearly been played upon him, he put on his cloak again and departed, bent upon tracking the culprit quietly down, for the king supposed that he must be a member of the household, in which case, no matter who the fellow was, he would still be within the palace walls. Accordingly, having equipped himself with a small lantern shedding very little light, he made his way to the dormitory above the palace stables, containing a long row of beds where nearly all of, the ser of his servants slept, and since he calculated that the author of the deed to which the lady had referred would not yet have had time to recover a normal pulse and heartbeat after his exertions, the king began at one end of the dormitory and went silently along the row, placing his hand on each man's chest in order to discover whether his heart was still pounding. Although all the others were sleeping soundly, the one who had been with the queen was still awake. And when he saw the king approaching, he realized what he was looking for and grew very frightened. With the result that the pounding of his heart, already considerable because of his recent labors, was magnified by his fear. 
He was convinced that the king would have him instantly put to death if he were to notice the way his heart was racing and reflected on various possible courses of action. Eventually, however, and observing the king was unarmed, he decided he would pretend to be asleep and wait for the king to make the first move. Having examined a large number of sleepers without finding the man he was looking for, the king came eventually to the groom, and on discovering that his heart was beating strongly, he said to himself, this is the one. Since, however, he had no wish to broadcast his intentions, all he did was shear away a portion of the hair on one side of the man's head, using a pair of scissors that he had brought along for the purpose. In those days, men wore their hair very long, and the king left his mark so that he could identify him by identify him by it by the next morning. He then departed from the scene and returned to his own room. The groom had witnessed the whole episode, and being of a sharp disposition, he realized all too clearly why he had been marked in this particular fashion. He therefore leapt out of the bed without a moment's delay, and having laid his hands on one of the several pairs of shears that happened to be kept in the stable for grooming the horses, he silently made the rounds of all the sleeping forms in the dormitory and cut everybody's hair in precisely the same way as his own just above the ear. Having completed his mission without being detected, he crept back into bed and went to sleep. When he arose the next morning, the king gave orders for the palace gates to remain closed until his whole household had appeared before him. They duly assembled in his presence, all of them bareheaded. The king then began to inspect them with the intention of picking out the man whose hair had been shorn. Only to discover to his amazement that the hair of on the hair on most of their heads had been cut in exactly similar manner. This fellow I'm looking for may be low born, he said to himself, but he clearly has all his wits about him. Then, realizing he could not achieve his aim without raising a clamor, and not wishing to bring enormous shame upon himself for the sake of tri of a trifling act of revenge, he decided to deal with the culprit by issuing a stern warning and showing him that his deed had not passed undetected. Whoever it was who did it, he said, addressing himself to the whole assembly, he'd better not do it again, and now be off with you. Many another man would have wanted to have all of them strung up, tortured, examined, and interrogated, but in so doing he would have brought in, into, into the open a thing that people should always try their utmost to conceal. And even if by displaying his hand he had secured the fullest possible revenge, he would not have lessened his shame but greatly increased it, as well as besmirching the fame of his lady. Not unnaturally, the king's little speech caused quite a stir amongst his listeners, and a long time subsequently elapsed before they grew tired of discussing between themselves what it could have meant. But nobody divined its import, except the one man for whom it was intended, and he was far too shrewd ever to throw any light on this subject while the king was still alive, nor did he ever risk his life again in performing any deed of a similar nature." And that's that. Bye-bye.